us a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. Take the exam first on your own before watching these step-by-step -step solutions. The link is in the description. Number one asks a reaction with a negative value for the change in free energy is referred to as exothermic, endothermic, exergonic, endergonic. So what are we talking about? We're talking about free energy. So Gibbs free energy is associated with delta G and we're looking for a negative value for this change. Exothermic and endothermic these relate to enthalpy. Exothermic means delta H is negative, and endothermic means delta H is positive. So those are not the ones that we're looking for. Exergonic and endergonic are words that relate instead to delta G, to Gibbs free energy. A negative delta G is referred to as an exergonic reaction. Endergonic would be delta G is positive. A negative value for the change in Gibbs free energy, that's delta G equals negative, that is going to be exergonic. Number two asks, which of the following is the best nucleophile? A nucleophile is something that can donate electron density. It can attack some positive center, some region of electron deficiency. So a nucleophile is something that has electron excess. So which of these has electron excess? Well, it's definitely not going to be methane. Carbon doesn't have a lone pair or anything like that. It's not going to be the ammonium ion because the nitrogen doesn't have a lone pair either. Ammonium will be similar to methane in that regard. There's nothing that can do any attacking. NH3 does. We do have a lone pair. And in fact, ammonia can act as a nucleophile. However, hydroxide is going to be a much stronger nucleophile because we have a formal negative charge, right? This formal negative charge makes this a very good nucleophile. We have a lot of electron excess with that formal negative charge. So ammonia is a good nucleophile in certain contexts, but the hydroxide is going to be an excellent nucleophile. So we're gonna go with B hydroxide. Number three asks, which of the following is the best electrophile? So whereas a nucleophile is something that has a lot of electron excess, an electrophile is something that has an electron deficiency. So it seeks electron density to coordinate to it. Electrophile, file meaning love, loves electrons, wants electrons to come coordinate to it. First we have butane. Well, there's no electrophilicity there. There's no region of electron deficiency. There's no partial positive charge. There's no formal positive charge. So that doesn't work. B, ammonia, we do have a positive charge on that nitrogen because it is coordinated to four hydrogens. But it's not really going to work as an electrophile because it cannot accommodate any more bonds, right? A nucleophile cannot coordinate to the nitrogen. It's already coordinatively saturated. It cannot accommodate any more bonds. It's got a full octet, so that's not going to work. Water, of course, is not really going to be a good candidate here. But let's look at D. We have this carbocation. This works magnificently as an electrophile because some nucleophile can coordinate to that carbon. We've got a carbon that has a formal positive charge. If it receives a bond from a nucleophile, it will become a neutral carbon and it will then have a full octet. That's a very favorable situation. Carbocations are excellent electrophiles. So this one's gonna be D. Number four asks, a catalyst lowers the blank for a reaction. Is it activation energy, change in entropy, change in enthalpy, change in free energy? If we are looking at an energy diagram, we have reactants, we have products. This is going to be the activation energy. That's the activation energy right there. What a catalyst does it is going to lower that value. It is going to lower the activation energy. So here's the new activation energy there. So this is going to be A. What we need to understand about the catalyst is that it does not alter any of these other parameters. It does not change the position of reactants or products on the energy diagram. For example, change in enthalpy or change in free energy, that is determined from where the reactants sit to where the products sit. So if those don't change their location, none of those values can change either. All that we're changing is the energy of the transition state. There's the transition state for the uncatalyzed reaction. Here's the transition state for the catalyzed reaction. That has dramatically lowered. So it is the activation energy that is lowered, none of these other values, so that will be A. 
Five asks, the point on an energy diagram with the highest energy is reactants, products, intermediate, transition state. We can have an energy diagram like this, and it doesn't matter if this is endothermic or exothermic, whatever the change in enthalpy is, whatever the change in free energy is, the highest point here, or the one with the highest energy, we're talking about potential energy increasing this way, this is the transition state right here. So the transition state is the highest energy configuration that has to be reached in order for the reaction to proceed. So the reactants need to collide in a certain configuration with enough energy, called the activation energy, to reach the transition state. That's the highest energy situation. It's like pushing a ball all the way up the hill. If you can get it to the very tip top, then it is definitely going to roll down and get to the products. So again, it doesn't matter whether reactants or products sit higher. It is the transition state that is definitely going to be the point on the energy diagram with the highest energy. So that will be D. Because the products sit higher than the reactants, then in the reverse direction, the activation energy necessarily has a smaller activation.